All right, it is the 12th of August 2021, and you're listening to The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. And we're back. Well, three of us. Three of us. Adrian is here. <laughs> Jeremiah is here. Two and a half. Okay. Um, Imar, um, still, we, are, we have weird recording times right now. So, um, you're doing this on a yeah. Thursday night, which is very unusual. Um, and Adrian. Adrian is in a tin can. <laughs> so sounds like he's on the phone. Um, you're on vacation uh, right now. So, thank, thank you for, for coming here. And recording with us despite being on vacation with your family that's um high praise for us well i don't i i, I enjoy doing podcasts with you guys you know <laughs> i don't need a vacation from that i apologize for the technical challenges i've had on my audio uh so sorry everybody that's listening to this uh, that's fine uh, we should but, replace uh, your video in the video with with a photo of you holding a, a phone receiver <laughs> like back in the old, old days an old one mm-hmm <laughs> Do you know what? I, can you get me um, Terence Stamp from Wall Street? I, I think that that, or is it Michael Douglas wandering, Gordon Gecko wandering along <laughs> the beach with his cordless? I think that's what I want to look like. Make me Gordon Gecko. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, yeah. So, um, what are we? Gonna, what, what are we going to talk about today? We looked at six photos in last week's episode, Jeremiah and I. Um, and Adrian, you had the honor to bring us a topic for this episode. I did, yeah. Um, so, so this is linked to my family vacation, as you might expect, because I'm a fairly, you know, see it, call it as I see it kind of person, <laughs> I hope. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is about memories. This is uh, uh, the future of memories and thinking about, you know, well, you know, what, what way do we... Uh, what way do we capture things that, that make the best memories for friends, for family, for events, for whatever? I mean, you know, I guess a lot of us, uh, certainly I do, and I, hope, I suspect many of the listeners have this sort of unofficial role as family photographer and, and documenter. You know, you're, you know, uh, I'm usually the one that people call in our extended family when they say, oh, we're having this. Can, can you make sure you get some photos of my boys or my girls or whatever, you know, nephews, nieces, you know, grandchildren, whatever it is, uh, which I am very pleased to do, actually. You know, I, I don't mind that at all. But I guess a lot of us have that role. And then you think, well, what, what makes it's got me thinking what makes the best memories what is it that um do you what is it that you you, you think and you go back to and you think oh yeah that that's a great memory yo is it could it yeah and, and i'm talking about you know the the medium i guess in part um you know it could be it could it is it a single photo or an album or a short video or do you do you, do you make epic movies of, you know of your vacations or your trips or travel um you know that that sort of thing and then there's some technical stuff as well we can talk about have your image quality does that matter does that impact a memory you know uh so you know and, and i guess it's not just for family photographers either because some of us are fortunate enough not to have been burdened with this by their families <laughs> and you can just have the luxury of focusing on doing it for your own benefit or just in a in a non-pressurized way because it does get a bit pressurized sometimes here's a, but anyway here's a that's qu- the conversation here's a question um are there three different kinds of memory creating images i the the kind of traditional everybody grouped together look into the camera okay <laughs> and say cheese and click <laughs> That becomes something. Number two, uh, stray shots, random shooting of, they could be out of focus, they could be following stuff, you know, at an amusement park, at a event where you're just randomly snapping and you catch as catch can, but it's the, I guess it's the collection, what we used to have slideshows of like 10,000 images around my boating trip at the lake. You know? I had an I had <laughs> an like, uncle you know? like that. Yes, um, I have yes. a father like that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. My father was like that too. So, uh, and he used to shoot half frame Konica pictures. So, not only did we have in every you know basket not thirty six but seventy two shots of every roll. Wow. Anyway, um, but he also captured in 16 millimeter and also very, very interesting stuff. But there is a third, um, a third, I guess, technique now, call it, or style, which is the selfie, where people are taking ownership of their own memory 
And so they are much more into presenting, uh, I would say, a fiction of how they would like their life to be remembered or presented. And those are, they're all part of the same kind of discussion, really, because they all are about diaries, right? Visual diary, uh, some for public consumption uh, and influence, others um, just because that's what's always happened. In other words, the kind of formal family photo, uh, which we see from weddings all the way to family gatherings. And then we have the catch as catch can, where you have the, um, I guess, the amateur photographer burdened with several cameras, 800 lenses, who <laughs> are trying to get the best, uh, and the just snapshooter, generally now with their phone. Um, each of them will um, enable a different kind of style and a different kind of image making. I think where we go is that where I was uh, always looking at family albums with prints stuck in an album with those corners or stuck in and in later years maybe, you know, glee glued on with a cellophane, depending on how you're age uh, looks, but that would be like a book of family photos. Um, now everything seems to be focused on the web, on digitization, on creating those kinds of things that are um, presentable and one sends one's shared albums to the family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We should just discuss what becomes of the true memory of each of these styles in the context of each of these presentations. It's different, that's for sure. And what is to be gained by those capturing and those generations later that will be looking, especially when we are very vulnerable to losing all our digital media with one EMP event <laughs> basically some, right? some some archivist uh, told me that uh, the last uh, 50 years will be the least well documented uh, I, years of human history yeah i i've said this myself in yeah. in other words the most photographed and the least recorded long you know term. you know uh, it's interesting which uh, you both of you had apparently had uh, parents who were doing a lot of photography and filming. And so you grew up with that. Um, for me, it was very different because I grew up being the photographer, but not the family photographer, because uh, I, I came of age in the 80s. So it wasn't that normal to have your photo taken. You know, most people weren't used to that. And uh, people around me weren't used to that much. So... I usually ended up being the stealthy street photographer type because um, people around me were a bit more annoyed by this this guy with the camera and and I, I and and I couldn't oversaturate them because I just couldn't afford the film so I I couldn't shoot all the time so whenever I had my camera out it was blatantly obvious there's the guy with the camera and around my friends and so on I f I find that unusual uh, and I'll t I'll tell you why because. Um, Ger Germans, writ large, I'm overgeneralizing, mm -hmm. um, have have really um, a a place in history oh, as yes. a rec recording culture. Yes. They photographed everything and they made lists and documents and all of that, no matter what. Keep pounding that desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're right, but for for some reason it was different with my family. So my my father, he he always had a had a compact uh, camera in his glove box because he was on construction sites and uh, documented things there. But I, yeah, I was the the weird one with the with the with the with the SLR um, trying to sneak pictures. And interestingly enough, I didn't take those pictures for the future. I didn't uh, I didn't really take them to create future memories. I just took them because I, because it felt right. I, I couldn't even That's even. That's an interesting thing. 
So the interesting thing is now, just just a while ago, uh, my parents they cleared out the basement of some old crap, and uh, my mom asked me, uh, "How about these old boxes with slides in them? What what should I do with them?" It's like, <laughs> let me let <laughs> let me get them digitized. So I sent them off to a service. I had them I had them transferred to files, and um, it's a lot of the photos that I took. It's even older Kodachrome slides that that. Uh, someone took and gave my parents of some events it's my little brother who's like 14 years younger so he he was born when i had my when i bought my first slr um so there's a lot of him and uh and now i'm sitting on this treasure trove and we, we're not talking about a whole bunch we're talking about a couple of two three hundred photos maybe um but now now, now i'm sitting on this treasure trove of old childhood pictures and uh, pictures of my parents when they were younger and uh, as there was not, not no real photographer around um, this has become an amazing uh, bucket of sentimental value um, <laughs> but it, it was it was my sister's birthday recently and I just put a whole bunch of old childhood photos of her in a in, a, in an album and gave it to her like a physical album and uh, it was probably one of the best presents that she's got in a while. Because yeah. um, oh. they, they, there is old children's albums, of course, of us, but there's not, there's a lot of that stuff is not in there. So I've done that with my kids. I've just printed when Apple was making books. And you, know, you could just kind of throw one together. I, yeah. I, I gave those a book of a collection, printed book. It was such yeah. an amazing gift, well received. Oh, and I remember refusing uh, taking one of these family shots that you uh, talked about, the gr the classic group shots, everyone smile, three, two, one, cheese. Um, and I remember refusing to take one of those because um, <laughs> the light wasn't right and the, the setting wasn't <laughs> right. And I, was, I was a very... Um, Okay. Let's uh, let, let, let's say I, I was I thought I was a better photographer than I was, so I was like, I, it's <laughs> impossible to take a good photo here, so I didn't take it. Interesting, isn't that's, it? Uh, that's interesting. So okay, <laughs> uh, that, that's good. So it, it is. It's interesting how we all have our own angle on this, and we all have yeah. our own experience on this, isn't it? Because you know, we're, we're talking about things that we've done in the past, and so there's, there's an element of memories, but I think you know, which is about. What what do we think now of the stuff that we did in the past? And I think that's that's an interesting line of conversation. And I think there's also a, you know what projecting what we think might be good memories in the future with all the technologies we have available to us. You know what do we think might make the best memories of the future? And and does that align with what we're choosing to do today, or would that require that we? step outside of what we do today and add something else to the actions that we take the way that we make images moving or still or whatever uh, or does it uh, does it mean that we all get to go shopping and buy new stuff <laughs> like, what, what does it mean exactly well oh here's We're a more prof here, here's a more profound analysis which is is our quest for memory capture um a a, a, a human desire for immortality to be remembered and to remember that's more I, profound i i never really felt like that and i i just noticed when i looked at looked back at how i shot photos it wasn't for memory it wasn't for it wasn't to be able to pull them out later and uh and, and point to the past not really maybe not for you not what for me. Was... Not for me. For others, it certainly is. I mean, I can see this yeah. now, and uh, all those pictures. I mean, they bring smiles to people. Because, but but only because of what is on them. Because when I was fourteen, I was not a good photographer. So those pictures <laughs> are technically, yeah, average. I would say. Um, but... We've discussed though uh, in the past that holding a hundred-year-old photo as an object. Uh, not even knowing who's in the, the pictures um, gives you a connection to life cycles, and you know you know that the, everyone in the picture is now dead. 
You know what I mean? What was their story? There's a curiosity about that. And and I think that anyone seeing a picture of us who didn't know us in a hundred years would be have that kind of shared experience where there is some kind of connection that we yearn for. Uh, and I'm saying this with memory generally, like, like how do, you know, what, I don't know any, many people writing memoirs now. I do know some um, who, who have written significant memoirs from, you know, rock and roll in the 70s. And it has interest because of nostalgia and all of those things. There is also the, you know, how do we relate to each other when we cultural, culturally came of age? You know, was it, you know, during Mario Brothers or Pong? You know, <laughs> was it uh, checkers and chess or Monopoly or whatever local games were played? But the creation of memory is part of the human uh, culture and and how we arrive at that. I think is is being, I want to say, um, corrupted in same in many many ways, and I don't use that term oddly enough in a negative way, but I, I use it as a kind of twisted memory. As I was explaining with selfies, selfies are very much a part of like memory. There's you're in control of the time you switch it, your background, your editing, your, your presentation, your mood, who's around you, and that's what you put out. Um, but I always feel that's uh, pretty much of a false memory um, because it is so uh, conscious or we self-conscious. Should, we should mandate that uh, whenever you take a selfie or multiple selfies, that you have to post all of them, not just the one you chose. Uh, good idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very good. That's, idea. A, that's a nice idea, isn't it? There's also, it links in or it, it, it makes a, a connection in my brain as well to, uh, and I may get the word here wrong now, there's, there's a... Um, there, there's a, a, a school of thought that looks back on the way that travel photography, especially in, in the Orient, ha, has been conducted, um, and uh, you know the, the, that it, it, it paints a picture of, of other parts of the world as, as seen through a rather romanticised Western eye, uh, rather than you know a, as it truly is. I, th I think the term is Orientalism, but I, I may be wrong on that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's something that gets, you know, something like that is uh, often uh, a, a, a reaction to your sort of National Geographic style photographs, which perhaps romanticise the, you know, the the savage native as opposed to showing how the world really is. Um, I know that uh, Steve, St who shot Afghan girl, Steve McCurry? Yes, Steve McCurry, yeah. Yes, uh, it's it's definitely a, a a term that's been used to to challenge some of his work. You know, of you know things like um, steam engines traveling past the Taj Mahal and stuff like that. <laughs> it's it's, uh, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? That sort of thing. I think that'd be nice. Yes, to say okay, well you can take your selfie, but then you've got to turn around and you've got to take, you've got to show us the photo from the other angle as well. <laughs> yeah, it's like, just for historical accuracy. <laughs> you mean the bullet train on the other track? Yeah, 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 Probably. yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. you know, there's it, in, in nature photography, there's now a term called ethical exif. You know, exif data that shows you the, the, uh, yeah, yeah, the yeah. data of the camera and when it was shot and what aperture and so on. And then there's uh, the suggestion of adding new fields to that uh, metadata set, which would... Uh, which would uh, tell you that uh, the animal in the, in the picture, was it handled? Was it moved to a different place? Did it survive? Was it put back where it came from? Um, was it in stress? Was it uh, candid? Was it, and so on. Like, um, give us give us more information yes, yeah. about the about the photo. So, so we can be judgmental about it and who you are and where you took it and your responsibility <laughs> I, towards yeah, it. Yeah, I, I see both that sides, you know. Good for okay, haters. Yeah. I think it's a good, it's a really interesting idea, especially seeing that photography, photographic composition is is often such an exercise in reduction, you know, and and subtraction. Um, you know, to to have to include all of that extra, 
you know, uh, stuff as well would be a, would be a, an interesting change on that. But there you go. So there's a there's a thought, right? So because we've never had the opportunity to do that before. So let's let's just let's just riff off that a little bit. This idea of ethical exif. So are we our are people fifty a hundred years from now? You know, looking at memories, uh, are they going to want to know that information? Should, is there something if we want to have, if we want our imagery to be not just relevant and meaningful, but even just understandable, you know, and, and uh, in 50 or 100 years. What, what should we be doing? Should we be doing something different? Now, you know, Jeremiah used the idea of you know, the, the 100 year old photo. Now, in those days, there wasn't a lot of choice, was there, right? You had a photo and that was it. And I have to say that for me, for, for, for the purpose of memories, if you're talking about a single photograph, I much prefer to have something physical to hold in my hand. That then for me makes the memory so much more tangible and and so much yeah you can pass a photograph around you can share it with people you can talk about it 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 might that might mark me as somewhat old school perhaps i don't know these days but you know for me that makes a difference um but but then for, for family stuff um I, I always think a short snippet of video where people are just interacting semi-normal, you know, not just hamming it up for the camera, but you know, you get you get to remember how people spoke and how how, how they behaved, and you get a, a much richer memory perhaps from a short snippet of video, um, and and maybe it's a bit more true to life because you know video. You know, uh, human memory changes, doesn't it? But what, what about fifty years from now? What, yeah, what, what should we be doing now? Should we be capturing a three hundred and sixty spherical image with every selfie? Should we be doing it all in VR because that's the way people are looking, I, you know, look at things in the future? I don't know. I have this. I have this notion of uh, photographic archaeology, which okay, which. We are entering a time when more and more will be captured, and uh, y you know the the we we talked about this the the one example with the Trevi Fountain where you take an algorithm and oh, yeah. take a whole lot of tourist photos and make them into this three dimensional thing. Um, that will be more real in the future because there will be more capture in three D in three sixty and so on. So there will come a time when everything that we do is going to be captured in one way or another and can later be um, put together into a big blob of data. And then it's your job as, an, as, a, as a photo archaeologist, so to speak, uh, with the right tools to dig out the photos that you're looking for, to dig out the moments that you're looking back to that you want memories of. There will be a completely different kind of memories. I don't think we will in 50, in 50 years. Okay, I'm thinking 50 years now. As you said, uh, in 10 years it won't be there, in 20 years it won't be there, but in 50 years for sure, that uh, we will um, we will not have to seek memories. They will be there. They will be at our fingertips in one way the or another. The problem is, uh, will those memories be dominated by Facebook, um, by... Oh, I sure um, hope Facebook is not going to be around in 50 years. Yeah, well... <laughs> I mean, I won't, will be so... <laughs> Yeah, they, you won't. Uh, you won't have to worry about that, Chris. So. <laughs> I, you know, when, when you know, just to di di, you know, di divul <laughs> divest a, a path here, um, diverge into another rabbit hole. But you know, <laughs> with Facebook and intention is as they descend and build and um, invest in their new future, which is the metaverse, they, uh, they yes. <laughs> very much want to do that, and issue their own currency, aka their own coin, and share that among 3 billion people. Uh, there will be an economy, both to earn and spend. There will be a massive population, and there will be a space in which to... Uh, travel and who will be the monarch of such a <laughs> virtual country, I ask. And so the control of memory and what is uh, going to be culturally acceptable or legally acceptable as uh, presentable will, I fear, depending on the battle of the blockchain versus centralized power, uh, be a whole other way of looking at our past 50 years hence. 
if everybody's work is on the blockchain and can never be manipulated, and I'm talking about from videos to home photographs to whatnot, those archaeologists will will be dusting a massive amount of information which they will have to assign some kind of logic to in terms of where we're at and why we screwed up the planet so bad and where our, you know, our political versus science conversations were. But but the how memory and you know Instagram is the same way and any of these social media sites that that encourage the kind of self presentation creates in many ways false memories but are those false memories <laughs> in fact a greater representation of the truth in our culture and what's expected so even the falseness of it, and we can kind of throw back to court paintings when someone wanted themselves painted by a fantastic artist, Neo Real, you know, holding their dogs, you know, they could have been the biggest assholes in the world, but presented as noble and, and wonderful creatures will then live on and present themselves in a way that that um, create that law you know, long memory, and we can go back and back and back all the way to the Sumerians of of how people wanted to be re remembered. So m memory is a very subjective, objective process that's never fixed. And the photographic methodologies we use, whether they be video or straight capture, whether they be high quality or thrown away, are, are really assigned to, um, I, I still think, this cultural need for uh, significance to be remembered, to having lived uh, just a small shout into the universe that their lives meant something. Check, please. And now, <laughs> and now everyone yeah, is like, yeah. that, that was a mic drop wow. moment here. It was <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So what's it, what do we do? Okay, what do we do? With, where do we go from there in this conversation? There, I think there's there's a good few threads that you've you've started there, Jeremiah. Um, and I think it's in, one of the, one of them actually just that jumped out at me as you were talking there was about the uh, the the evidence or the or the integrity uh, of memory. I was just you know you, you talked about if everybody's work is on a blockchain, right? So so in theory, let get. Yeah, uh, by which I, I, I interpret that you mean that there is a technological mechanism that cannot be interfered with that ensures that what you see is actually what was recorded, right? Okay, yeah. so so if there's something something like that, what does that? How does that change things? Well, I mean, certainly it, it, it can influence you know, the way people me remember things because people's memories can be corrected. And when you get into those he said she said arguments, you could go back and look at the evidence, couldn't you? Um, it's uh, it's going to make the job of being a propagandist a lot more difficult, I think, because you're not going to be able to come around every 30 years and spin a new story as to who did what when, because <coughs> actually the facts right. will be there. Well, so, yeah, that, fact, would have, facts, that would have geopolitical facts are, ramifications. Facts are not in the way. Facts, right now, we can see <laughs> no how, how facts really don't matter that much. And if you have an oversaturation of imagery, which you will have, because we already have an oversaturation, then I guess a lot of people won't bother checking the facts. They'll go by whatever feels right. So that, yeah. so there, you, there you're getting into... Uh, uh, and, and I haven't even started I mean, talking you're, about you're privacy <laughs> just yet. <laughs> no, no, well, that's an issue as well, isn't it? But the psychology of it is interesting because there are psychological studies that show that people don't change their minds when presented with evidence. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so you're right. You've got the um, the contrariness of, of human nature to contend with there just because something is on the blockchain doesn't mean everybody's going to agree that it's true so it's it, yeah that's this it, this is great i love it when these conversations we have a little seed of an idea and they go off all over the place so that's what i was thinking about yeah, you know, what, what what do I need? What do I need to go out and buy tomorrow to make sure that my grandchildren have family memories that they think are fun? Um, and instead, we're talking about this. Yes, the psychology of human society as a whole. Excellent, good stuff. Mm. <laughs> I'm so I'm sorry for derailing this. <laughs> no, no, tell Me us too. about privacy, Chris. Take it with the privacy angle. Chris. No, no, I'm not even going to go there. Not even going to go there. 
that that's yeah, because I, there I, is I, no I, privacy. Well, anymore. I mean, okay, so 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 the reason I've talked about the about, about, about privacy is because um, we are uh, our sensibilities are changing over time. So uh, I again, I grew up in a time where taking someone else's photo was uh, a bit of an annoyance because. I remember people getting their passport photos taken, and when the when the 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 the, the, the city photographer um, switched to a digital <laughs> system where you could see your photo before they printed it out, that was a revolution because then you could go, no, no, I'll take one more, take one more. That was an early glimpse into this control of your own narrative thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and uh, and uh, I've seen this change into. Uh, a well, pe people are now like, okay, selfie, no problem. Pictures, yeah, not really a problem. And But then this is creating a rift between those who really want to keep their privacy and it's not expected of them to want to do that by others. So it's it, it turns into a societal thing again. And uh, I think the, those norms will change over time towards less privacy. I, I'm not sure it's a good thing, but... I think that's just what's going to happen um, because of all the technology and because of all these yeah, new things coming up. So, so there's, there's uh, a lot of things. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on out there and a lot of people with different points of view, aren't there? Right. I, I would say that, that because of the overwhelming amount of images that we are all exposed to, that the, the, the kind of net indicator of memory is going to be a little bit different. I know I spend I, I spend a lot of time thinking about this because I have a kind of a, a young granddaughter who is like my best friend and and uh, I I imagine what she will remember of me and and um, I, I I dare say it will not be all of the hundreds of photos that we've taken together whether it's me or whether it's my daughter or my wife capturing those moments, which are beautiful and 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 certainly provoking of of a moment. But what she will remember is really the time that we spent together. And so as and when I am with her, I am hyper conscious that I am building memory in a much more um, resilient way because that memory will be more feeling and I'm hoping that photographs well, may trigger the Yeah, the, because the photo, photos serve that function. They will As a uh, trigger. They, they will conjure up those feelings yeah. again. Uh, when, when she's in her, I don't know, 50s, 60s one day, um, yeah. she'll pull out some of those photos and she'll have those feelings back at that moment. She won't be pulling them out. <laughs> she'll, she'll be like it, summoning them it's it's well we, we're also calling we're it'll also be a calling a that, verb that has, sorry go ahead it'll be a verb it'll be a verb that has not yet been invented <laughs> That's true. They, they won't, people won't be pulling or summoning or anything they hey we still something. use a floppy icon for to save things come on these things are persistent they stick around it's that's true. true yeah yeah it's it's yeah that's just weird i don't i don't understand that one that is just weird either. <laughs> how many people have asked you young kids like what does that stand for that they don't thing? that's the weird thing they don't they just go oh yeah that's the save icon they don't yeah. have any concept of what it's it like means, a letter they do. it's like a I, yeah yeah it's an icon yeah it's just yeah it's just a, a funny, I've not thought of it till now. But most, anyway. of, most things that the kids use don't need anything to be saved either anymore. So, no. you know, it's, it's up, rarely that you have to save stuff. But anyway, so, so that, okay, so we talked about, we, we we got the big conversation. Now we have, as we often do on this podcast, we have the challenge of bringing it back down to earth and closing it out. It's too so, many loose ends. It's way too many loose ends right now. Well, I, I have I a have... question for you both. I have a question so for do you I. Both. So, so, which is, you know, what do you th what do you think is the, is the stuff that you're doing now, or perhaps the stuff that you you could be doing right now, that is going to be the most relevant memory generator, memory trigger, in let's say fifty years time? So you know, a couple of generations from now, what do you think that you're doing? The images or the the art or whatever it is that you're making that is going to be the most effective trigger. 
Well, if it's, you know, if it's me, I think, I think, and this has, you know, little to do with me personally, but it really will have to do with the work that I've done cinematically that will be promoted or overly promoted by large corporate <laughs> entities to reach a global audience for their own uh, reasons. And I will be coattailing that. I think that is something that will be, for better or worse, uh, remembered there. Um, in terms of my personal work, um, you know, it's almost impossible to uh, ascribe longevity, especially at this point. We are in, you know, a certainly cultural turning here with artificial intelligence and RNA vaccines and blockchain adoptions. And, you know, th there's so much um, change now, uh, dynamic change on every level that I think it's unimaginable that we could really truly predict what the world is going to look like in a decade. And for okay. me, it's 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 not photography. I don't think it is. Um, the, the thing I love doing most is teaching other people. So um, if anyone in the future thinks back and says, oh, yeah, Chris, I learned that from Chris, then um, yeah, that's all I, I think want. that's, that's, that's very all I valid. I, I remember yeah. getting getting an email from a young guy who, uh, who said, I, I've been listening to your podcast, and that gave me the... Um, That, that gave me the strength to apply to a photo school and to go get into photography and wow. uh, is now working professionally in photography. And that was that's one of my proudest moments when I got this email. Yeah, I would, I would, I would, uh, I would say that that's the same thing years and years ago when I was starting out, you know, I had a studio, I was uh, building my career as a photographer and there was a knock on the door of the studio, totally cold, cold knock. And uh, this, Uh, English guy from Bedford, of all places, I remembered, uh, came, was wearing Doc Martens and spiky hair. And he said, listen, I've been a, I've moved to Canada. I've been a tool and die maker for, you know, came up through that system for, you know, 10, 15 years working in a factory as a tool and die maker. And um, I am at a crossroads. I'm either going to continue this as my life, but I am passionate about photography. I know that you're a professional photography. I would like to learn from you and work for you. And I said, you're hired. And I hired him and he, I, and I hired him instinctively because anyone who's a tool and die maker is a detail oriented crafts person. This is no joke. And he was with me for over 10, 12 years as my principal assistant, traveled all over the world, you know, working together and uh, had a tremendous career as a photographer. And that changed his life so completely. And that, for me, also is one of my proudest memories mm -hmm. that just saying yes would create that. Um, I, I do have another question that's interesting going back to the kind of minutia of memory that we create photographically. Do you think th that lo-fi, and by lo-fi I mean kind of not that um, technically adept photographs of a subject familiarly, is more effective than a um, hi-fi or you know, you know, a 4K, 6K, 8K massive imagery uh, of the same subject when it comes to memory, um, just because of the commercial invasion of high quality image. I don't think it makes a difference. No. I don't think it makes any difference. Because I, I, I look back at some of these old pictures that these old slides that I had digitized and some of them are really not technically good and some of them are and they serve their purpose as memory joggers they get you go ah remember when then, then the stories come out and I don't think there's a difference between the technical powers I, that's interesting I think there is possibly a difference um, I would say that 
the current modern technologies that we have are not better at triggering memories. I would say they might be slightly overproduced, <laughs> just for a, straight for out of the can. So do I do I want um, uh, do I want to be providing my grandchildren with memories in the form of 60 frame per second video <laughs> well, no, no i don't because i really don't like that as an aesthetic <laughs> um do i so so the so in the sense that i'm i am on vacation right now and i am deliberately setting out to make a family vacation video because i haven't done that for a few years and i'd like to have that to come back to later which is part of what triggers this this conversation today um i am shooting the best quality image I can shoot in the sense of quality. So I'm shooting high bit rate, I'm shooting log profile, etc. On on my best camera, um, with, with an external microphone to capture as best audio as I can in a run and gun sense. But I'm shooting natively 1080p, um, and I expect to generate a video that will be mostly viewed on phones, so very small screens. Um, although, of course conceptually it could be viewed on larger screens as well so but i don't think uh, I, I think almost it's it's like that that trope in the movies and in tv where a, a flashback will, will have some sort of lo-fi effect applied to it uh, i think in some ways actually the lower the fidelity of the memory the more it triggers but See. that's pure speculation and, well, and a very I, subjective I, view, very subjective view. You know, you know. Okay, so so here here's another memory. Here's another memory um, from my childhood. My uncle, or one of my uncles, um, he was a photographer. He was also a videographer. Videographer. Um, he he did. He shot this uh, India vacation. It was a big deal. So he shot that in Super Eight, and uh, he brought back. I don't know how, how much footage. He spent about a year editing this, cutting it, as in cutting it, as you did with film. Yeah, yeah. Um, then he had a, a, a magnet strip added to it so he could put sound on it, which he has. He shot the entire thing without sound. Uh, he had this big stack of uh, sound LPs, like sound effects and yeah. things. And uh, he, I think this thing ended up being about an hour long. Uh, and the memory I have, and and then it, it of course it was uh, my aunt g go g getting on an elephant, uh, getting off an elephant, getting on another elephant, getting off the elephant. <laughs> it was, it was the memory of, of of this ordeal of having to watch this one hour thing that he spent one and a half years producing, and uh, it was his first and his only movie of that sort. Oh um, it was it the memory that that stays with me till today was sitting there through it not what was in the movie but the sitting through the it oh my the God, actual experience funny. of having to go through it when i was eight years old probably so Hilarious. that's the kind Hilarious. of memory that he created without even knowing <laughs> Hilarious. yeah that's it's a it's a very interesting question, Jeremiah. You clearly have a, a view on it yourself. Yeah, I think that uh, memories. Uh, yeah, I, again, I'll speak just for myself, but but I don't want family photos to look like a Coca Cola commercial, perfect backlight, dripping water. Like I don't, because I I instinctively feel I'm being sold. That's false. And that's why the lo-fi version feels more real. It's also another mm. reason why the, you know, the, the emergence of the culture of, you know, bit graphics and, you know, those mm -hmm. 70, 80s really nostalgia. What is going to be the nostalgia of today in 20 years? Um, you know, identifying that is going to be, you know, good question. <laughs> I, I suspect yeah. anything that is presented in two dimensions in a rectangle will probably be considered <laughs> nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a lot of it, but not necessarily collectible, right? Right. No, indeed, indeed.
Mm. Anyway, let's great let's, conversation. Uh, let's yeah, thank you very much. Let, let's leave those open ends, those open threads open, and maybe we get some comments on our Twitter account, uh, Tief of Now, or on Insta or other places. Um, time to have a look at our picks of the week. Adrian, you brought hardware. I have, yes, hardware this week. So, uh, as, as I just mentioned, um, I am shooting a family vacation. Uh, and so my pick of the week here is actually two products, but they work well together. Um, it, it is uh, a, a, a camera cage and a top handle uh, from a company called Small Rig. Um, so uh, many people will know the brand, I'm sure, and many people will know the kind of products here. But uh, just for those that don't, perhaps, um, you know, the, the camera cage is, is, a, is a metal surround that you, you can screw into the tripod of your uh, mount of your camera, provide you with lots of places to attach stuff, attach things like lights and microphones and, and rails and focus pullers and stuff like that um, and uh, I, I have only attached two things so far I have attached a top handle which just uh, it literally is a handle on the top that you can carry it around with and I've got a microphone sitting on the side of mine as well um, so uh, yeah that's that's my pick of the week um, they, I got them new for this trip um, and uh, I'm enjoying it it's, it's a good Isn't good Good to be able to just ha have a top handle and just carry the camera around. Wherever Isn't like. it amazing how how these things have become like a a, a simple thing to to get your hands on? When I, I remember remember when that whole thing started, and you had to like wanted a cage. Yep, five hundred bucks at least. Yeah, and, yeah. Now, and now we're uh, talking uh, like seventy nine dollars for for a small rig cage. Yeah. Oh, I mean, all these and, rigs and, and it's. It's really sturdy. It's got any number of holes in it you know, so that you can screw stuff into it, all the, all the relevant sizes, you know, um, and yeah. stuff like that. So it's it's very easily accessible, very affordable now. Um, it's and, basically grip equipment from the movie industry right. that has been adapted to consumer level, and soon they'll be made out of plastic and for $12. Sure. So. Not yeah, if they if they can make them out of plastic for twelve dollars in a way that is robust enough to use sure, over time, then I would be very happy come. to see that uh, these ones yeah. are metal and uh, yeah, yeah good, they look good, good. strong stuff. I know. All right, Jeremiah, you brought us uh, feature uh, on lensculture.com. Uh, I did. This is because we were talking about memory and uh, the creation of memory. Um, I I I thought that this particular artist um and we may have feed, i may have shown this before uh, way back no, when no you haven't i haven't oh seen good that before good uh, i think uh, be, yeah I, I i just felt that this is um I would, false memory real memory uh memory is art snapshot is art um it it, it they're very evocative they're very personal They are a form of using snapshots in a very different way, um, and and uh, to that end, I'm um, I'm quite impressed. I don't think they're the snapshots. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. In they, fact, they want they, not. they they want to feel like snapshots. Yes, with a very and kind there's of, there's uh, this interesting a, in in the between kind of feeling with them because you yeah. I know they're not snapshots but they they feel like snapshots and on first glance you could see that as snapshots but then they turn into they for me they flip in my head from being a snapshot to being a work of art. Yes, um, and and it's that kind of gray zone. Here's a perfect example yeah. out of out of focus foreground. Very typical of of an instant. A shot, of but, but here, there is some artif take. artificial feeling about it still. You know? Yes, the lighting is very particular. So it's a bit of an uncanny uh, valley thing going on here. Yes, and of course that that's why I like it. That's cool. I like it. All right, and I've brought a photo that I think um, uh, that that I feel is iconic. We all know the um, lunch lunch atop a skyscraper. Uh, the the Rockefeller photo, the one that the the workers sit on on a beam uh, over Manhattan, and this is by the way not a not a snapshot. This has been very, <laughs> this has been orchestrated. This photo, but there has just emerged another photo, and um, you know I'm a bit of a space nerd, and uh, the uh, Elon Musk's 
SpaceX company, they have uh, just a few days ago brought out their, their super heavy booster, which is a 70 meter high uh, rocket. And then they, they stacked Starship on top of it, which made this into the world's biggest rocket. And um, here is an iconic photo that came out of that. So <laughs> this is at what we're looking at, um, for those not uh, looking at the video, is a photo, a black and white photo uh, at the at that point where the, the Starship gets stuck on top of the super heavy boost. So that's 70 meters in the air. You see the workers, they are on little race platforms um, far away from the ground. There's there's ropes pulling the thing into the right direction. There's a heat shielding on the top part. There's these grid fins, which are uh, means to to steer the thing when it comes back down uh, from its flight from orbit. Which, by the way, one of those weighs three tons. So we are talking about a big piece of equipment, and it's been taken from a drone. This is a DJI Inspire Two um, that flew around it and took photos and video. And this is just one of those pictures that that evokes the same feeling and people uh, equate it to the to the rockefeller photo because it is, uh, it's very iconic it's, um, it's great the light is great the composition is great um the the moment is feels a bit like a historic moment and uh yeah this I, i'm pretty sure this will be for for quite a while to come this will be an uh, iconic photo of sorts cool. it's fabulous fantastic it's my photo of the week, probably of the month, maybe the year. So anyway, that brings us to the end of this episode. Um, yeah, we've left a lot of <laughs> a lot of loose ends <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but nah, it's okay. That's okay. That's okay. It's okay, yeah. why not? Why not? Um yeah, so uh, maybe, yeah, let us know what your thoughts are out there about memories, about future memories. Um, maybe we triggered something interesting in you, maybe something. Yeah, doesn't... remind us, lest yeah. we forget. <laughs> yeah, that's true, <laughs> memories. Um, so, yeah, we'll be back in, um, yeah, we'll, we'll work on being back in a week from now. It's looking quite good. So until then, everyone, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.